the ancestors are coming. Are we ready? Do we do everything? We figured out the food, sacred space, the everything. Oh man, we need to make sure that we have this right because we don't need to bring dishonor on us, dishonor on our house, dishonor on our cow. Wait, you don't have a cow. Hmm. But we still need to make sure that we're ready. Yes, we're still prepping for Samhain. There's a lot of stuff to do. So let's talk about making a sacred space for the Samhain today as we walk down Creation's Path. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a Christian pagan druid and priest of Bridget. Hello, my name is Brian. I'm a pumpkin and I'm also dived as mischief maker. Today we're going to be talking about making sacred spaces for Samhain. I know you're probably thinking, wow, y'all are doing a lot of prep work, but this is one of my most important holidays of the year. There are four of them that I see as very important. Imolk, Bieltana, Lunasa, and Samhain. But Samhain is the start of the new year. So all the things that you learned from all the holidays this year, all the things that you want to do up into the next year, it's all coming to a head and we get to start fresh. And I love that fresh year feeling. It smells like apple pie, mainly because we're going to be cooking a lot of stuff with apples, but let's not get off track so soon. If you're not already subscribed to the podcast, make sure that you do that. Hit the like, subscribe, follow, whatever the button is on whatever the app is you're listening to us on. It really does help us out. Plus, we do five original episodes every week of Christo Pagan and Druid content. And you don't want to miss anything because we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. And we could just do two and a half, three hour episodes. But we thought it would be easier instead of giving you this giant to-do list for how to prep for Sawin, break it up. So if you've missed our previous Samhain prep episodes, go check those out. Today we're talking specifically about sacred spaces. Everybody break out your broom. Yes. Now, very important, make sure your broom is not made out of broom. It's actually a plant. Oh, I was like, wait, did my broom eat other brooms? I mean, I only had that happen once and it was scary. Broom is a plant that is used to ward off the other crowd. So if you're using a broom... Because I know a lot of people for their craft like to use natural, all na all natural brooms and stuff. If you're using a broom that the bristles are actually made from broom, you're actually telling the other folk to get the F out of your sacred space. And then you're inviting them in? Kind of rude. They don't broach rudeness well. It will not end well for you. Think of it this way for all those pet owners out there. It's like when you, you're trying to clean the room and you tell the dog to go F off because it's in the way. You're trying to clean the room and then it comes back and it's moody the rest of the day and the next several days. It's kind of the same thing. It's more like when the cat wants to sleep in the sun patch and you move her out of the way because it's time to sweep the floor. Yeah. yeah. Kids. Or the kids. Yeah. They all get moody. You don't want to upset the other crowd. So, yes. Now, nah, we, we are going to be using a broom to help clean out our space. Now, you don't have to have a fancy broom. You don't. There's some beautiful twig brooms that are out there. A lot of places will actually be selling them as part of their Halloween decor. Especially a lot of craft stores are going to have them. Again, make sure the bristles aren't actually made out of broom. I'm so cracking Cause, up because that, oh gosh, I want to go to like a local craft store. Or not local, but one of the big chain craft stores and grab one of the brooms and just hand, holding the broom in my hand, ask you to tell me, excuse me, is this made out of broom? Because, as I said earlier, I'm a mischief maker, and I just love the idea of the expression on the person's face going, you're holding a broom. And it's like, but is this made out of broom? <laughs> I'm very amused right now by that. There are very few hard and fast rules about dealing with the other crowd. And one of them is always be respectful. Like, the they, impoliteness and disrespect are the easiest way to get on their bad side and never, never say thank you, but always show gratitude. Yeah. Uh, it's a little tricky, it's exactly. a little tricky, a little tricky, but of the rules that you need to live with, if you're going to be working with the other crowd, those are the two big thou fouts floating out there in the cosmos. And yeah, you don't want to be making them angry when you're cleaning out your space. And that's the thing. You should clean out your space. Like I said, you don't have to have a fancy broom. You don't. If all you have is your regular broom, that's got the plastic bristles that you bought at the local department store that everyone has that used to have a star logo, but then it turned into a dot. And I think it's a star again. <sighs> Make up your mind. You know, the company I'm talking about, 
They don't need my advertising money. I'm not saying their name. That's fine. You use that. It's perfectly fine. You don't have to have a fancy magical bird. If you can afford one or you want to make one, have fun with that. Go out, get yourself some branches, have fun with that. I'm kind of contemplating seeing how the weather is closer to someone because usually around this time of year, we have a windstorm that blows all of the old leaves off of the trees and knocks a couple of branches down. And I might try to collect those branches up and make a twig broom to use for us this year. Actually, this year, oh, if you remember the, the kind folk in the grove, the one tree spirit grew a branch yes. for us that we're yes. supposed to be using. So we'll be cutting that and yes. using that this year. I'm just saying there might yeah. be others that we use for the twigs to yeah. bind at the ball. Yeah, it was a whole crazy thing because that branch grew in a weird, crazy place on a point which tree it never should have grown. And it, it did not grow at the same rate of any of the other branches. It's, it's just the right size. Now. And it's almost perfectly straight. Yeah, which is also weird because this tree doesn't have, its branches yeah. aren't perfectly straight. Yeah. None of them are in this entire tree. Yeah. I was doing the practices out of Penny Billington's wonderful book, Nine Ways to Charm a Dryad. Great book. Highly recommend it. And uh, apparently like it worked well. <laughs> that It was the tree that I was communing with during this process. And the tree spirit was like, I'm going to ma make a wand for you that you can use for various things like a broom and a staff and what have you. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. And went out like a couple days later and there was this huge, this really big branch growing off of the trunk that wasn't there. Yeah. And I was like, oh. Really low in the trunk where branches don't grow. Oh, say be crazy. Yeah. Use what you have. That's what I'm saying. There is a spiritual capitalism thing, especially with witchcraft and spiritual practices that can just sap your pocketbook. And you don't have to buy anything. Remember, this all grew out of home practice. And the reason they used a certain kind of brooms in the olden days is those were the brooms they had in the olden days. If you want to get a fancy one, if you want to buy from a pagan shop, have fun with that. That's great. Not something you have to do. But yes, we're going to sweep out our, our space. I recommend that you do it twice, once counterclockwise to banish out all of the things that you don't want in there and once clockwise to bring in the surety and the intentions that you have for the space it's a great way to do it and nice way to get started also don't forget to, to clean the entrances to your house you have guests coming your ancestors are coming the other crowd will be coming to the, to, to the house whether you let them in or not is for you to decide Make sure that you get a nice presentable place for, for them. All right. Dust your altars. Clean your altars. Make sure everything looks nice and pretty. Now, should you build a special Sawan altar? Okay. If you are an Instagram influencer and you need some really, really nice pictures, definitely. Definitely 100%. I love looking at them. Really yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Look at I don't do seasonal altars like that. We have a couple altars that we use. We have our prosperity altar. We have an ancestor altar and we have a main altar in the living room as well as I have one next chick to me. That is my kind of personal daily reflections altar. Yeah. We have altars all over the house. Did an episode about it. It's not really a problem. It's a slip of problems, but yeah, you don't have to make a special one just for some. Now you may want to think about what is on the altar and tailor it to the seasons. Maybe you want to change out the main focal point. Maybe you want to change out the deities that are on there. Maybe you want to rearrange them because some of those deities are more aligned with the season that we're, that we are going into. Maybe more of them are more liminal, you know, on the borders, on the edges and kind of guarding those passageways between the seasons. And maybe they should be more central in this period of time. Some things to think about, but you don't need to go out and spend a lot of money to buy a whole bunch of these statues or gourds or anything else. If you want to, and you have the money, I'm not going to stop you, but it is not a necessary part of the practice. I will say, make sure that you have your offering bowl and that it's clean because you probably should be doing an offering of maybe some apples, some bread, some butter, some porridge, porridge is very traditional this time of year and something that we are definitely going to be doing and any other offerings that you're going to be doing. We don't have to do anything immense for this. Go as far as you feel inclined to do. If you want to get special colored candles and the light and really deck out your altar, go for it. If you don't have the finances or the energy just isn't there, it's not a requirement. And I do feel like some 
practitioners of the craft make it sound almost like it's a necessary requirement of the season. It's not. The yeah. practice is for the practitioner, not the other way around. We keep the practice so the practice keeps us. Put in the amount of energy and effort that you have. But do start thinking about what are you going to be putting in your sacred spaces? Are there any loved ones that have passed on that maybe you want to add pictures to your ancestor altar if you have pictures on your ancestor altar? You might not have thought about it, but now is the time to maybe, if you can handle it, if the grief's not too fresh, think about whether or not to, to add them on there. Have you started working with a spirit that you need to add to your main altar? Now's a great time to be th thinking about that and whether or not they need to be there. Have you been gifted a face stone recently? Do you know the purpose of that face stone? Should that face stone be on your altar? I have to say, the last gifting of fake face stones that I got was the Fae all worked behind my back and like everyone I knew bought me beautiful collection of stones for magical practice. I still haven't finished sorting through all of them for use yet because there's so many, so many for so many things. And some of them have this purpose and some of them for that purpose and some for other purposes. I'm still trying to figure out which one to turn into the healing stone because I really want to bless the special healing stone, but we can talk about that on a future episode. Have you come across a face stone? Do you know what a face stone is? Face stone is literally a rock that is just gifted to you. You may come out and notice that there's a stone on your front step on the sidewalk outside your house, just sitting there and it just catches your eye. You can't take your eyes off of it. You just really want to pick it up. You want to take it home. That's probably a face stone. It's a gift. And you can start figuring out who gave it to you and why. Because it's one of the ways that they show connection. You might, fi might find a twig on your front step. What is that gift for? Is that something that should be on your altar for this time of the year? A whole branch that I've been given instructions on. And I'm occasionally reminded that I haven't done stuff with. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it could be all kinds of stuff. This time of year, the other crowd is getting very active. And with the full moon that we just had, I mean, the energy was crazy. I know I was feeling it. You were feeling it. I went online and everybody's like, am I going crazy or is this full moon just zapping power like cra crazy into the world? No, not just you. The moon, the moon is doing things. And from a traditional way of thinking, the moon is where the ancestors all huddle up before going to different places. They all meet in the moon. If they're going to go into a new life, they go to the sun. But as they're transitioning from place to place, they travel through the moon, according to the old stories. I think we're going to have a major visitation this year for the ancestors. I think they're looking at all of the uh, things that are going on in the world right now, and they have opinion. So just prepare yourself for that. I think we're going to have a very active season this year. And on that note, do you have an ancestor altar? If you've been procrastinating about making one, the ancestors are coming. What do you want your ancestor altar to look like? It could be pictures. Like I said before, it could be it's just mementos that mean something to you. It could be just a little something. It could even be as simple as realizing you actually already have one. Because a lot of people will have that, that small shelf in their house, generally in the public gathering room. And there's that spot on the shelf for pictures and family stuff. Yep. <laughs> and it's like without even recognizing or realizing it. And anything put there that's not that is immediately cleared off of that. Because it's not supposed to be there. There's this weird instinctually... And then it's just a matter of going, oh, yeah, actually, I do have one. Cool. Job done. Check. Because remember, altars don't have to be special places. They could be a corner of a book a bookshelf. They could be a corner of any kind of shelf. They could be a spice rack that each level of it is a different altar for different purposes that you put little th things on. It could be a corner of your desk, the corner of a table. It doesn't have to be a big, elaborate thing. If you have the space and the willingness to do that, more power to you. But again, this commodification of the craft has really kind of, I think, made people feel pressured to have big, elaborate altars. They can be little things. They can be little things. We use the top of our entertainment center as our main altar because it's two things. It's right in the middle of our living room. We see it all the time because the TV is right underneath it. So we're always reminded of the spirits that we're working with. And it's a great space to just lay everything out. And we have our prosperity altar up there. We have our ancestor altar up there. We have almost all of our altars right there. Maybe that's something that you could do. Nook beside your bed. Some place that you can make special. Altars could be temporary. You could just set up a tray table in your house. Here's your Sawin altar. And you're gonna use it for this festival. And when the festival is over, break it down, put it away. That's fine too. 
I do think that it's good to have a regular use offer, but you do you. This is a time of offerings. Though. This is the thing to really be thinking about your sacred space. Like I said, we are going to be making offerings of porridge, apples, bread and butter. We're going to be making off offerings to our ancestors specifically of dried pineapple, for example, from my one grandmother who I absolutely love and want to have an offering for her when she comes to visit. I just picked that up yesterday. You need to be thinking about how are you going to deal with the furry friends that you have in your home? Because a lot of us have cats, dogs, and other pets. For those that live in certain regions, you have little furry friends that hang out outside that as the weather cools, they migrate in. Field mice and other little furry friends. Now, I have to say it is part of the tradition to see if a mouse gets into your offering that is seen as a shape-shifting fae or a means for which to phase the in. I'm not saying that you should shoot the mice. That's not what I'm saying. I would just say that's the, one of the more traditional ways to do that. Rats are a different thing. Rats are never seen in a good light in the tradition, but sometimes with mice. Also, that's something to bear in mind because we have cats. We have three cats. Should field mice get in and try to get into our offerings while we're asleep, the cats will try to get after them. Are they in a place where the cats can cause mischief? Because again, it is a time of mischief. So think about how this is going to interact with your furry friends that you have in the house. Some offerings are poisonous to your pets. You may be leaving out chocolates for an ancestor. Chocolates are poisonous to, to dogs. You need to make sure that wherever you're putting that offering is a place that your dog is not going to get into that offering. Where they can't be knocked over to end up in the space where the dog could get into it. Be very careful. Be very mindful. We're using a lot of dried flowers in this time of year, and we're using a lot of candles in this time of year, and dried flowers and candles don't mix well. Also, cats and candles don't mix well. Cats and candles don't mix well. We, because of the cats and other considerations, have turned a lot of our always on or overnight on candles into electric candles because it's the light that we're offering, not the wax. I don't know who offers wax, but it's the cans that we offer, not the wax. So it's something that we can do and I don't have to worry about that causing problems. For those that part of their practice is the, the offering of the smoke, let's be honest, do incense. Yeah. It's gonna be safer yeah. and, and a lot more smoke to offer. Yeah. Uh, we had a cat once that learned to respect the altar space because they were causing mischief and their tail accidentally got into the candle flame. Yeah, his tail went into the candle flame and went whoosh. It went whoosh and learned real quick. And I'm pretty sure that wasn't accidental either. If you've ever had to chase a cat whose tail is literally on fire around the house. Yeah. It's not fun. It's not fun. It's not fun for anybody. Not fun for everybody. Just be mindful of how your sacred spaces are going to interact with your furry friends. Because... The, the, there's a chance that they are going to try to interact. One of the reasons we use our entertainment center is it's in a place that the cats can't get to. And that they know not, they're not allowed in. Yeah. It's, it's once again, part of that sacred space is setting up the boundaries and going, this space is for this purpose only. And they know that that space is a boundary that they are not allowed in. Yeah. So be considering these factors. I'm saying furry friends, because I know some people also have ferrets, mice, Guinea pigs, all kinds of furry, furry friends, hamsters, Hamps. and whatnot. You need to be taken into effect how they could react should they drink a libation offering that you put out, or if you're leaving wine or whiskey on your altar and one of your animals gets it to it, you know, you need to be thinking these things through and making sure that you're setting up the space so that you don't have to have those considerations in the moment. You can just make your offering. Also, make sure that you have it so adorned your sacred spaces, that there are tripping hazards around them because nothing can take away from the joys of the season than tripping and spilling a libation offering all over the altar. And you can get to the moment where you're telling yourself, and that's how I'm giving it to the guy. So that's how you wanted the offering this year. But it's going to be a lot of cleanup. You don't want to do that. Make sure that you're not putting things in what places you're going to trip. A lot of people are making jack-o'-lanterns and stuff this year, maybe positioning them on the floor near your altar. Make sure they're not in any of the walking paths. Just be mindful of the space that you're making. And there's a lot of little considerations to be thinking about here. How are you wanting to do the lighting? Do you want this altar to be aligned to a specific direction? Our altars all face west because we want them to catch the light from the rising sun. Maybe 
you want to have an altar towards the north because that is the direction of the energies that we're currently going into. Maybe you want an altar facing the south because you want to call some of that prosperity and that energy up, up from the south. You may not want to have your altar oriented the way that it normally would be. And those are some considerations to have for this time of year. Do you want to do something different seasonally with the orientation of your altar in your sacred space? That could be as simple as there are times when I've noticed that it just happens that our statuary will turn to different directions throughout the year. No matter what we do, turning them around, they will have decided, no, I'm facing this direction. We self-adjust. The Fae and the house spirits are very active in our house. We also have some ginger tea. Now, on the, the idea of gifting, because this is a time for offerings and stuff, remember, never give your house spirits clothes. It isn't for any reasons that would be found in the children's book authors who hates trans children and wants bad things to happen to them. It's considered offensive. It's not that it sets them free or anything that a crazy person who doesn't understand what the Nazis are would, would put into their fiction. They find it offensive. It's learning the etiquette of what you're doing. So you don't give cloth things to your house spirits. You don't give clothing to them. It's something that they find offensive. Are you going to do a special offering for the seasons to your house spirits? We are going to be offering a porridge to the other crowd. They're w willing to partake of it. We're going to continue doing our regular offerings to them anyway. So I am not doing anything special this year for the house spirits, but that may be something that you want to do. Maybe they really helped you out with something this year and you want to get them something special. What would they like? Ask them. They will give you a dream. They will find a way to let you know. I'm laughing because... Every time you mention porridge, there is a moment of great excitement and over-under bedding going on right now as to whether or not the chili that is currently slow cooking and, and making the whole place smell so nice counts as that porridge. And occasionally, petitions like, that would be amazing if that counted as the porridge. Thinking of like an apple yeah, You can no. feel it in the air right now. There's a lot yeah. of like, oh my gosh, is that it? Is that what they're talking talk about? about? And we're both very intuitive in our craft, and that may not be you. Yeah. I, I feel like we need to say that. We are very intuitive. It's actually one of the things we connected on very early on is we have both had very intuitive relationships with spirit. You can develop that over time. There are some wonderful resources for that. But if that's not you and this holiday is approaching and you may not have the time to develop that intuition between now and then, dream work is a great way to communicate with the other crowd. Ask them the questions, ask them before you go to sleep, ask them several times throughout the day. You will get answers to your dreams. You do a guided meditation. If you're familiar with journeying work, you can journey and ask them. There are ways that you can have these conversations if you're not somebody who is very intuitive and experiences a more visceral experience of the other crowd. Um, but yeah, figure out what it is that you need for your practice. Again, some people may see this as vague, I, we're trying to share with you what we are doing and letting you know that you don't have to do the same thing, but hopefully inspiring you to be asking yourself, well, what do you want in your own practice? What would be a good thing for you to have in your day-to-day -day life, as well as, as we're preparing for solving? And on a quick side note, it's okay to have ideas and ambitions and intentions and plans and life to happen in it not to get done this year. There's always next year. Don't beat yourself up. I had some neat ideas and thoughts for quite a few of the altars in the house, and I will eventually get to them, and it's okay. Hopefully I get them done in time, and if I don't, it's okay. And I'm going to say this because I think I, this should not be a controversial statement, but I am learning more and more the things that I think are just, well, duh, are controversial statements. Your altar is for you. I know we tend to think of this as an altar for the gods, guardians and guides but that altar is really for you it's a table that you set to develop relationship between the two of you and yes you're making offerings there but the vast majority of what is there is there to help you get into the mindset to connect with the spirits as you were there at the alt if you're working with a deity or you feel like you're working with a deity that would be mad at you if you didn't have x y or z on your altar check that relationship because that sounds a little toxic to me. Also, check and make sure you're not the one that's going to be disappointed and you're projecting that potential disappointment on that spirit. 
because I'll let you know, at least from my own practice, which as you can tell from our conversations is very rooted in work with the other crowd. As long as you remember to put the stones up and the offering, everything else is gravy. The altars are there for us for the most part. So don't stress about it too much. The queen of the wind and the hunter are not going to be upset if you don't have the right things on the altar. If you don't have a proper raven on the altar of the many things that you could offend the, the Morgan with, that's not one of them. You know, if you have a nice raven and you want to honor the Morgan, do that. If you don't, trust me, she's got bigger concerns than whether or not you have the, pr the pr proper ritual implements on your altar. That's not really how the deities work. That's, again, very much out of the fantasy story tradition that we have. And also something that we have inherited from Imperial Christianity that we need to deconstruct and get out of our own practice. Yeah, we're, we really aren't worshiping angry gods. Yeah, it really isn't the thing. Not really the vibe here. And if, you, if you're feeling that vibe, I, I, I would check that. I would check that very sincerely. I work with a lot of spirits. I even work with Lilith from time to time. I have found Lilith to be stern, but very motherly. I see some people when they talk about this fear, this terror, this dread. I, I, I think that's projection more than it is the spirit you're actually dealing with. Again, like I've said, in all my years of practice, there's one spirit I have encountered. One that I will not tell you its name, and I will not tell you how I encountered it, because no. Even when you look at the stories of Christ, a lot of times when he was like at the party and stuff, where she saw the property and the other one is spending time with him, he doesn't really judge or chastise either. It's okay. It's how they feel they need to express their practice, and both are great. Or are they, because in the end, it's like, are you getting the message? Is it, is it for you? Is it helping you out? Because if doing all that cooking and cleaning and work is not helping you out, then sit down and just enjoy. Enjoy the feast. And also the wonderful <laughs> stories when people are breaking about the, the other guests at the party. Like, yeah. how dare you be here with these drunkards and harlots and da, da, da. Yeah. Like, I, I think of like the stories of the Dada. He had his most prized possessions, the most sacred instruments stolen. Gets a war party together, goes out knocks out the entire army and all he does is just collects his stuff back and that's it at least at least because you know what he got his stuff back and that's that that was it that's what he wanted that's what he wanted he could have easily had them all slaughtered yeah because he had them all the sleep. sleep but no a lot of those stories when you think about it this isn't as, as big of a thing a lot of its projection the only celtic deity that i would even be really concerned about that we would possibly encounter in this time of year is prom Krua. And that's because I can't wrap my head around him. So I don't know how he would react to things. I would never, in a service of devotion to Dion Keck, say, like, I am the greatest healer ever. Yeah. That doesn't end well for yeah. people. Yeah. I'm better at healing than you. Yeah. But, you know, we're not saying that there aren't things that you could do to offend the spirits. It's just, I think we worry too much because we have this undeconstructed notion of the imperial christian god that we need to work our way through the most of these deities do not function in that way and do not have relationships with us like that there are some that you need to be very carefully in relationship with like the morgan but that's because respect in knowing how to interact with them is very important yeah and you don't want to offend them like some of the others this time of year that i guess i it's about respect. Yeah, it's about respect. Yeah. So hopefully this has helped you out, giving you some ideas of what to do for your altar. I know I'm looking at do doing some carved things. I was almost thinking about if they're at a good price, getting some turnips and trying to carve a turnip just because I don't understand how do. That makes no sense to me. And I've always wanted to do it. I think about it every year and then I don't do it. But what, what are you planning on doing? How are you setting up your sacred space? Let us know in the comments. If you're listening to us either on Spotify or on YouTube, you can leave a comment right there and let us know because I think we all have our own ideas for what is a good thing to do this time of year. I would love to see yours. This may spark some good ideas for us to do as well. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if they say you can leave a comment there, they don't notify us about them and we can only check so many websites in a day. So you can leave a comment there, but copy it, head over to creationspass.com, click on the chat. You can leave the comment there and we will be able to see it and have conversation with you while you're there don't forget if you have a few dollars you can pass our way you can join and get yourself a membership there or you can support us on patreon or Kofi. i see dorset on both that's dorset with two t's 
And that just helps us keep the lights on, keep food on our table, and keep a roof over our heads. If you don't have any money right now, don't worry about it. Maybe share the episode to people that might like it. That's apparently been happening a lot lately. We've been growing fairly quickly, and thank you. Thank you for that. Um, wow. Thank you. Definitely going to have you all in our intentions this saw one. Uh, wow. All righty. Usually I end these episodes with a prayer to the one life, but as we're getting ready for Sawan, I've been doing something a little bit different. And so as we're getting ready for this time, may the queen of the wind and the hunter come to you and help you to find the path forward and to find all the things that you need to bring down that path into your home so that the space will be made ready for when they pass by and for all of the great ancestors and spirits that will be coming our way for this Samhain and for the season to come. Amen. Amen.